Oh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, generative AI has captured the imagination of many. We're seeing labels that range from revolutionary technology to existential threat. This is making boards around the world wonder what's expected of them. Should we be running or walking? Should we be excited or concerned? Are we thinking big enough? And most importantly, what question should I as a board member be asking my management team? The objective of our discussion today is to arm you with information that will help you tackle these questions and thoughts. Uh, on our distinguished panel, we have Bina Amanat. Bina is the author of the book, Trust for the AI. She's the head of Deloitte's AI Institute and founder of Humans for AI, a not-for-profit focus on improving diversity and inclusion in AI. Prior to this, she's held senior executive roles at the Bank of America, GE, and British Telecom. Welcome, Bina. Thank you so much, Khaled. Um, and we have Paul below. Paul currently serves as the Chief Data and Analytics Officer for the NFL. He's responsible for the league's data, data science, as well as technology activities, including AI. Prior to this, he established data analytics functions for a number of companies, including GM, Ford, and Dun & Bradstreet. Paul currently serves on the Hyatt board and has served uh, on the New Star board previously. And for our global audience, the NFL stands for the National Football League. Welcome, Paul. Great to be here. Um, and we have Sumit Gupta from Google. Uh, Sumit leads product strategy and product management for all Google systems and middleware infrastructure on which a lot of these AI systems sit. Um, that includes search, cloud, YouTube, ads, and maps. Prior to this, he was IBM's chief AI strategist and NVIDIA's GM for the AI and GPU business. Welcome, Sumit. Thank you for having me, Paul. Um, in terms of the agenda for the next hour or so, we'll get started with some top of mind questions for our panelists. Then we'll do a lightning round where Bina, Paul, and Sumit can share their top of mind questions that boards should be asking their management teams. Um, and then we'll aim to cover as many questions from the audience as we can. You're all welcome to ask questions in the box that should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll collate them and raise them with our panelists. Let's get started. Um, Sumit, starting with you, help us understand what is generative AI and how is it different from the broader AI technologies? Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the AI revolution, uh, the modern AI revolution kind of took, started about, you know, eight to 10 years ago. And uh, what happened a few years ago, uh, which is now manifesting in this generative AI, is that we've discovered technology that can essentially read anything and start to appear like an expert. So the number one thing is that it, it can actually start communicating to us in a, a natural language like English. Um, and uh, it essentially can form sentences which you know look like they're human formulated sentences. So it has this ability to get the knowledge of everything it's read. And then you can query it and say, Hey, um, you know, everything from, I'm sure, you know, uh, I know my kids have been playing around with chat GPD and uh, having fun, you know, probably using it for essays in, in school, <laughs> but you can also do, you know, I would say enterprise grade stuff, which is, for example, uh, read all these contracts in my company and generate a new contract similar to the one we did with the NFL, right? Uh, and it's capable of generating that first draft of the contract. Now, there are challenges. Um, you know, there's a term called hallucination. And as the term says, what generative AI doesn't know, it hallucinates, it makes up. So, you know, I, I kind of joke, it's like a kid and the kid has learned a bunch of things, but as kids do, when they don't know something, they typically don't say, I don't know. They just make it up. And, and that's the hallucination in generative AI. So it's very powerful technology. And, you know, I talked about the language aspect, but we're seeing it in images. You can generate an image by just saying, draw me a puppy surrounded by sushi, uh, you know, and it'll make this image. Um, and you can, you can make it do video. So, uh, so you know, it's, it's multimodal as we call it. It's, it's multiple media types. Uh, and, and I equate it to senses. So it can talk, 
it can, you know, well, draw or make videos, you know. And music, actually, and music, which is the most recent one. Um, Thank you, Sumit. Yeah, Sumit, you and I met first time about five years ago, and we, and we, when we had just started recruiting CEOs for AI companies, it was a topic that was uh, a hot topic in the tech community, um, but was still niche uh, outside tech. How did we get here so quickly uh, over the last five years? And, and what are some of the opportunities and applications that you're seeing? Yeah, you know, um, I'd actually love to hear from the audience on this, but I'll make a provocative statement. And, and I'd love to hear, you know, maybe you have a Q&A uh, a tab, please, uh, you know, you can ask questions, you can make statements. But, you know, my perspective is that I think a majority of AI ML today is still being deployed by what we call digital natives, right? Companies that were born on the web or born in tech. And enterprises, although they have gotten uh, ahead on their analytics journey, are still struggling with deploying AI. Um, but I think generative AI is one of those technologies that actually up levels the ability to, uh, to take advantage of AI. Uh, my favorite joke these days is that the new programming language is English, right? So you can give uh, a prompt to you know, Google's Bard or ChatGPT and ask it to write code for you. Right. And if you're smart about how you write these prompts, it'll write pretty, really good code. Right. And obviously, you know, all of us are uh, uh, creating these co-pilots, which will uh, which which write code or help you code faster. So I think the bar to use AI just got lowered for enterprises. And I mean, we should talk a little bit more about this because it's a complex topic and I'd love to hear actually other people's opinions. Thank you, Sumit. Um, Bina, you've been an advocate for trustworthy AI years before it became mainstream. Tell us more about it and how has that space shifted? Yeah, so you know, I think I'll start with a data point. So my book, book published on trustworthy AI last March, and it actually sold double the copies in the last five months compared to all of last year. So I think the topic, the interest in the topic has definitely gone up a lot, uh, thanks to advances in generative AI and you know everything that Sumit was talking about. It is on top of mind for the for the average person, right? It's elevated it beyond just the uh, the folks interested in tech or working with tech to making it, you know, right from my mom to you know my dog, you know, family physician. Everybody has you know has heard about it. So I think. You know, it's it's a good thing because it's elevating that conversation. It's making it top of mind. And um, what you know, my focus has been uh, is really you know you hear a lot about ethics and bias and certain areas that have been doing the rounds in the last few years. Those are absolutely important topics. But you know, from an enterprise lens, when you want to address it, it's best to think about it as the side effects or the risks that come with using any technology. So take something as simple as bias, right? We, we've heard a lot about bias in the context of AI for several years now, right? Uh, very crucial, but when you go down to the use case level, then you know there are actually ways to think about what does trust mean in the context of bias. Let me give you an example, think of, you know, and I, I'll use the example of facial recognition, right? We've seen, you know, and with EU's AI going out, you've seen facial recognition can be terrible in certain use cases, right? Because it's it's may come with very deep biases. But if you're using facial recognition in a scenario which is happening even today, is uh, you know to identify human trafficking victims or kidnapping victims. Right. The question to ask is, what's the level of acceptance of bias? Is it helping us rescue 60 percent more than we could if we didn't use it? Is that acceptable? Or think of facial recognition being used in a manufacturing plant uh, for worker safety. Right. If a worker is you know, falling asleep or there are certain actions right, that depicts that you know, he, he or she might be distracted. Is it you know, what's the level of bi bias acceptance? But if it's being used in a scenario like law enforcement, absolutely not, right? 
So I think, you know, when I think about trustworthy AI, I'm thinking about what are the dimensions of trust? How do you translate it from an enterprise lens? How do you take it down to the use case to be able to actually implement the, uh, the factors of trust to be able to address the risks that come with using that technology, whether it is through training or governance controls, there are different mechanisms that enterprises have at their disposal that can be leveraged to actually address those risks. Got it. And, and as you work with your clients, how are they doing that in terms of balancing the opportunities with these risks that, that you just talked about? Yeah, yeah. And personally as well, right? Having worked at um, uh, companies like GE or British Telecom or even Bank of America, right? They, you know, you don't, it's it's not the motto of, you know, build fast and break fast. It just doesn't work if you are, you know, looking at jet engine <laughs> failures or trying to predict flight paths, right? You have to have software that is very reliable. And, you know, and many of these industries, you know, have governance and controls, follow regulations, and there are very clear regulations that you can follow. So the so governance and controls play a big role. Embedding those questions within your uh, pro project management tools, making sure your all your employees are aware about, you know, the risks that come with it. And you know, setting it up, it's kind. I, I think of it as like there's a common notion that if you have, you know, regulation or if you have best practices in place, it will stop innovation. And that's absolutely not true. You know, we've seen several cases where you, you set up the guardrails, which will help you innovate faster, right? But it's important to think about those risks and setting up those guardrails proactively and address it. And that's that's what you know most companies are doing. Uh, in addressing these risks. Got it. Thank you. Um, Paul, while I do want to get to your perspective um, as a board member, I can't help myself. And on behalf of the NFL fans, must ask, how is the NFL using AI technologies and Gen AI in particular? So I, I think one of the things that that's, was important that was alluded to is when you think about the journey we've all been on of using advanced analytic tools and capabilities, it's been going on for quite some time. It's been embedded into advanced manufacturing, my old life in automotive, autonomous vehicles. And then increasingly levels of it are driving our decisioning and our workflows in all organizations, including the NFL. We use it in terms of player health and safety, a program we call Digital Athlete, for instance, which is leveraging computer visioning capabilities, certainly helping us in terms of our marketing and our outbound comms activities. But for the most part, any advanced analytics organization, some form of machine learning, if we properly define it, is the core methodological foundation by which we're doing all of our analytic work. What's different in this case, which is why I commend you for putting together this session, as with most parts of this revolution, you hit a certain part of the journey where the democratization of the technology and the capabilities becomes that much easier. The discussion around lowering the bar. And generative AI certainly takes us down that path, at least in part. I make it equivalent to what we experienced back in 2001, 2002, when really e-commerce was being enabled by technology, and we started to go through that initial phase. In this case, it helps us in terms of creative development. It helps us in terms of being productive. Contracts are a good example. It will affect the legal profession. So we're experimenting on all of those work frames or all those workflows to determine the best applications. And we're trying to strike that right balance between democratizing and governing. And the word I would use is governing. And what's interesting for us is that governing is not just the output of the application or the deployment of the technology, but increasingly it's about data governance, which is the backroom operations of organizations like myself that doesn't get as much airtime as others, but has become critically important because of the stewardship of data being more important. So we're covering all fronts, like most organizations, advanced technology is affecting all of our workflows and our decisioning environments. It's gonna be interesting to see where we head next because you hit these inflection points where adoption curves go up. And it's gonna be an exciting three to five year period of time, but the last three to five years is also exciting and, and we'll go from there. And, and Paul, um... You've been a technology leader for, for several years, and you've been you know, at, at the helm of uh, uh, some leading companies, GM, Ford, et cetera. 
Um, how is this technology evolution different in terms of how you're seeing it? I, I think what's important for us as we go through each one of these phases, and it's exactly the way you guys have discussed this or framed this today, is when the bar drops. And when the bar drops in terms of broader application and usage, and that can be due to cost or it be, could be really the ease of use. And as we go through different phases of this journey, and if over the last, I've been doing this for almost four decades now, but you go back to those periods of times, it's humbling where we underestimated what that dropping of the bar would mean. I'm so dated in terms of technology. I remember when we all had to sign up to use one standalone desktop computer that had two <laughs> software applications. Uh, so I've been around for a long time seeing this, but what happens is technology occurs, the cost of entry, cost of usage drops, which is not only economic cost, but it's a sophistication or knowledge level that drops as well. And that's what's interesting about this next phase because yes, English does become the new coding language. That's a big change. And so for us, the real question is, how does that then drive the ubiquitous use, drive the adoption, the productivity gains, the ability to connect with your customers more effectively? Because at the end of the day, that's what technology is all about. Help me improve the efficiency of the operation. Help me better connect with my customers. Those are the two things you're trying to, to drive forward. I think number of backroom operations will clearly be transformed by this. We saw it in manufacturing 15 years ago when we transformed assembly plants. We used to have 5,000 workers. Now they have 1,400 workers because of what happened. We'll see that. But then on the other end, it'll create new jobs and new opportunities and components of this. So it's exciting. I always hate to call the ball. This like my forecasting background. Uh, this is the next phase and it's going to be disruptive and largely in a good way. Um, thank you, Paul. Let's switch gears and talk about the board. Um, what was the impetus for Hyatt to bring you on as a board member and what expertise were they looking for? So to the credit of Hyatt, Tom Pritzker, the chairman in particular, is just a forward-leaning thinker. And Tom reflects deeply around the things that are going on in the external world of to Hyatt that will affect the business, both positively and in some cases a threat. And I can remember my first meeting with Tom, my meeting with Tom was on a Saturday morning uh, in Chicago where we sat down and we spent about an hour just talking about technology and data and analytics and where the field was going. And Tom took copious notes. And I just always remember him taking all these notes and we almost a decade later now we talk about it. And what Tom realized was that having individuals that have the deep subject matter knowledge if they can be adapted to the role of a board member, provides great context setting and enhances the governance. And as you look back on it, in the case of Hyatt, it's all the things you would think about where they're going technology, where they're going with one-to-one -one personalization, but also into data security and data privacy. And that really, that's really what drove it. And up until that point in time, people in my role, individuals in my role would have a role with pure technology companies. But Tom saw it a little differently. I think if he were here, he would say it was a really good decision because the phase of the digitization of the world is affecting all industries and affecting all industries in a very profound way. And seven now going on eight years ago, he saw it, viewed it as a necessary component for the board uh, and thus brought me on. And it's been a very good relationship, I think, on both ways because of the fact that um, I get to understand another industry, which is always fascinating and try to help. And on the and from his perspective, he gets that balance on the board with somebody who can understand all of this. I don't think he was anticipating the AI explosion that's occurred, uh, but it's just maybe it's just good luck on his part that he's got somebody that lives it. But I would defer to Tom on that. Got it. Um, and what are some of the concerns about generative AI that, that maybe you start to hear from the board or board should be thinking about? If you're a board member, which I am, and when I have my other hat on, and you think about your two roles, you're in the advice and counsel business and you're in the governance business. Uh, you're not there to drive the day-to-day -day operations, but you're there to do so. Uh, what's going on in, in this particular next phase of the digital revolution creates opportunities for businesses because of the productivity enhancements and the other things that go along with it. But then, of course, it raises lots of questions. Uh, those questions involve data security. They in, in, 
include brand reputational risks. They include all sorts of operating questions. And in the board capacity, being aware of those issues and being able to then ask the appropriate questions, of course, a big part of our role. I would say equally as important for all of us from a board standpoint, it's just a bit of an unsettling feeling because when you see things that are out there in the media so prolifically and everybody's talking about it and the articles are being written about how existential this threat is and how it's going to destroy jobs and what about this and you lose your decision and control and and it just provides that unsettling feeling it is always much better to then have the conversations with the company themselves the operating management team who is uh, addressing these issues from the business perspective on a regular basis. Uh, so my best piece of advice is the best piece of advice to board members is a, this is another piece of a revolution that's been going on for 60 years now, 1955 is really the birth of this. Continue to ask the questions if you've been asking questions all along, questions you were asking as e-commerce was rolling out and other dimensions of this. And then on the secondary side of this, continue to educate yourself with regards to what you're seeing other industries doing, the risks that are being raised, there are all the organizations that are supporting us as board members because there's very good conversations going on, such as today's conversation. Uh, and if you do so, I think you can fulfill your role from a board standpoint, but you also deepen your own perspective on this next phase. And this next phase is, is an accelerated adoption of the journey we've all been on. Got it, thank you. Um, Bina, you advise boards on this topic several times. Um, what advice do you have for boards, you know, going back to Paul's point about preparing yeah. themselves, how should boards prepare themselves? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the key uh, focus for boards is obviously on governance, right? And, um, um, you know, AI does need a level of governance and the board insight. The, so the number one advice I give to boards, board members is, you know, get AI savvy, get AI fluent. Doesn't mean you need to understand the deep technology, but you should know enough to ask the right questions and make sure there are, you know, the, that the structures in place to cover the risks that come with it. And so AI fluency, basic AI savviness, and there's plenty of courses out there today that can, you know, get, get you that basic education about AI. Making sure that there is an AI savvy person, like Paul said, right? Who, who lives there, who understands how techno that technology is being applied in an enterprise world, you know, is important. I think we're going to see, you know, more and more of um, chief data AI officers getting to be part of boards, which has not been the norm. And then the third thing is really, you know, uh, looking ahead, making sure that you are able to separate the reality and the hype, where enterprises are really using this technology, how what are the best practices? How do you stay a little bit ahead to make sure that you can see what's coming? Uh, and you have the right you know, C-suite, the right leadership in place to make the most advantage of the technology while you know, addressing the risks that come with it. Got it, thank you. And that was not a planned question when she talked about making sure you have the right C-suite in place. Um, it, in terms of, um, thinking about the current news, there's a lot of, in the news cycle, you've got a lot of conversation about regulating AI. And, and we've had board members raise that question. And yeah. I, I'll start with you, Bina, I'd be open to getting other panelists to chime in. It, what's your take on that in terms of regulating AI? I think, uh, you know, it, it, there, you know, regulations are going to happen. We saw the EU AI Act that has just, you know, passed that first step towards uh, becoming regulation. And they're going to come, but it's not going to be a one size fits all, right? It's not going to be just one AI regulation. So I see at a high level, uh, you know, in, if you have to look at the two big categories, one is really going to be focused on extending ext uh, existing regulations, right? whether it's an addendum or an extension on, you know, when AI, how does, you know, the use of AI impact, say, example, for HIPAA, right? Being able to look at existing regulations, what's the impact of AI and how does that need to be extended? Because several of our, you know, industries that have existed 30 years or before, whether it's healthcare or aviation, you know, the manufacturing, there are regulations around it. 
So it's more of modifying them, extending it to impact, you know, the add on the impact of AI. And I think there will be brand new set of regulations that come up for industries that were created in the last 30, 35 years or so, whether it is social media or tech platforms, those, you know, will need new kinds of regulations. So what do you see in the media and what might come will have to be really a meaningful look by industry, and it can be at a use case level as well, is, you know, how do you extend existing regulations and how do you bring in new regulations where none exist today? I think it's important that we all just pause a little bit and realize the regulatory framework is the regulatory framework. Uh, it's there, it's upon us. And for companies to be successful against that backdrop, this is why having the right integrated stewardship program matters. So for us, we get up every morning and we have a team 100% dedicated uh, to working on the governance components associated with the regulatory framework, whether it's GDPR or the extension of GDPR, including AI, or what we're doing in the US at the state level, as well as trying to deal with trying to integrate across 50 states. It just reinforces that an organization to do this effectively has to treat it not as a one-off science project. That you have to treat it as a systematic approach to running your business and affecting your current operations as well as your future operations. And then the enabling capabilities become important. Privacy, consent, governance, all of those elements are absolutely critically important for organizations. If you're serious about this, we like to say you want it to be scalable, you want it to be repeatable, and you want it to be governed. You want to make sure you get those pieces in place right. And then if you do so, you can, yes, influence the regulatory environment, but I think equally as important, operate within the regulatory environment because the regulatory environment is not reversing direction. It is heading in a direction that may have some variance depending on the country, but the direction is a level of oversight and discipline and requirements that are just part of part and parcel of the life you live when data and analytics and artificial intelligence are just are driving decisioning and outcomes that affect people's lives. You know, um, I'd love to add something here. And, and actually, there's a Please. few questions in the Q&A, which I'll address at the same time. Uh, um, they're around uh, data governance, uh, protecting IP confidentiality requirements, and so on. Um, uh, my number one advice if you are if you have company data, please don't use an open uh, a free service. The reason it's free is that you know part of it is the the free is that they're taking your data and using it to train their models, right? And and if you read the fine print and you should, uh, you'll find some of those caveats in there. So uh, work with a provider who has written guarantees on protecting your data and keep your data is your data. You know that uh, that provider doesn't uh, access it, doesn't use it to train their models, and so on. Uh, obviously, I work for Google, and Google Cloud gives you that guarantee. Uh, but I'm sure many of our competitors do as well. Uh, so that's number one. So there are services available that protect your data, and your IP is your IP. They don't look at it. They they guarantee that and give you all the rail guards around that. Um, and, and likewise on data governance, data governance is a is not just, hey, who are you sharing data with? It's actually within the company as well, right? Who gets access to certain data, right? And I'm sure Paul deals with this a lot, which is, you know, uh, uh, there is a lot of PII data, person, personal information around even players, I'm sure in the NFL that, uh, you know, we are very sensitive about. So, I mean, you have to have a data governance strategy for your company. But even more with machine learning on NAI, where you need a lot of data to get meaningful answers, it's often easy to sort of forget or let's say uh, just munge it all together and make it available. So you, you need, you, I mean, this is not a like a two minute answer. This is a complex topic where you need people who understand data governance to really dive in and, and, uh, uh, and, and help uh, create a good strategy. It's a great response on data governance. One of the pieces of advice that I give to companies who are trying to set up data and analytics organizations or advanced analytics organizations, please start with a good data governance organization because data governance involves standardization, quality, access controls, all the stewardship elements as well. 
And if you don't tackle those issues, you won't be able to scale. You'll have risk in terms of the organization with regards to the data usage, and you will inhibit your program as you're treating this as an embedded initiative that transforms the business. Um, in many cases, it's the first thing I recommend to anybody trying to build out these capabilities at a company, establish your data governance function and your central data function, because data needs to be managed as a horizontal asset and the stewardship goes along with it, just like financial assets. You have to have this similar mindset that goes along with it. Thank you, Paul. Um, Sumit, you talked about generative AI and what it can do. What about the limitations of generative AI that boards should be aware of as they think about using this technology? Um, so there are definitely limitations around, like I said, you know, uh, the corpus of information that it can actually answer to. But to some extent, that's, you know, let's let's be clear, chat GPT is six months old now, right? So generative AI, the modern generative AI, you know, sort of revolution that they set off is six months old, right? And, and like, you know, Paul said, there's like a million news articles, right? It's like every day there's five news articles on something around generative AI. So it seems like, oh my God, there's so much happening. However, what really, it, it, what I'll say is we, we just got started, right? I mean, we, we went, uh, and, and I'm not trying to be the Google guy here, but I'll give you the example of Google, right? Which is we went from having no product six months ago that we had announced using generative AI to in May, uh, a month ago, we had our big show. We announced 25 products that are going to or have generative AI in, in them. Right, so my point is there are limitations, but we're just getting started. We, we, you're gonna see amazing, amazing stuff. I'm gonna answer a question you didn't ask. What are the opportunities with generative AI? Because I think that's more exciting. And at the same time, I wanna address one of the questions that someone asked in the chat, right? How, how do companies reconfigure their operations to make use of AI? What are the challenges they face? Um, <clears throat> Paul alluded to this. Um, this is like, I don't know, a classic manufacturing company 25 years ago who had no IT department and now says, oh my God, IT is a thing I need to do an IT department, right? Or the internet just happened and you're a retailer and you're like, oh my God, I need an e-tail business, an e-commerce business. You don't put two people in a room and go build an e-commerce business. You have to be serious. Right, this is a serious, serious technology shift. Right, there will be, and Bina said this, there will be CD, uh, CDO, CD, uh, uh, CA, um, Chief AI Officer, whatever. Uh, but you know, there will be people who are not only responsible for this, but have entire departments. Right, so you will eventually have. Maybe it's in your CIO office. Maybe it's in your CTO office. That's that's not what I'm trying to argue. What I'm trying to say is this is serious business. And how will companies reconfigure? Well, it's like e-commerce is a good example. You can't just do e-commerce if you didn't have anything. If you were a classic, you know, um, you know, let's say Macy's, right? You big brick and mortar store. You need to do a lot of stuff to take that inventory, create catalogs, create, put them on the internet, have price matching, discounts, all of that stuff. It's a complex engineering problem, right? So same way, AI is a very, very complex software engineering problem, right? And this was what I alluded to that, you know, the modern AI revolution took started about eight to 10 years ago, but a lot of enterprises have not been able to take advantage of it because the software engineering and, and the data engineering around it is complex. Now, generative mm -hmm. AI makes it easier. It doesn't solve these problems. You still have to, you know, put guardrails around it and, and so on. But definitely you're now, for example, getting, I would say a lot of pre-built vertical solutions from companies like us, startups, uh, many other companies in the world who are gonna create, for example, a legal assistant who that can generate the first draft of a legal contract. And again, maybe answering a question someone said, how do you make sure it doesn't hallucinate? There are ways to tell it only answer from this corpus of information. In other words, there's ways, here's a database of all the contracts my company has written. Please stay within the guardrails of these contracts. 
and and it still doesn't act uh, guarantee hundred percent accuracy, but it dramatically makes it uh, more um, uh, less hallucination, or it makes it much more accurate. Or uh, um, accurate is the wrong word, but less hallucinations. Uh, I'll pause there. Uh, you know, I can keep going on this topic. <laughs> I, I love you said uh, accurate is the wrong word. You know, so it, it's very interesting how we we just take the output that comes out of we assume is accurate. Um, you talked about a few um, applications. What's your take, Sumit, on where does this technology go? Let's say in the next, you know, ten years. Yeah. So again, I'll, I'll answer this with a question you didn't ask as well. Okay, and and I'm sorry I have to keep doing this, but uh, let me start by saying, if you're getting started on your AI ML journey, find the low hanging fruit first, right? So this is like, you know, before you go create an you know, e-commerce business, create a website, right? So it's the same thing, find a low hanging fruit. And, and so to the point you're making, where are the uh, use cases? Uh, customer support, right? Today, I don't know about you, but nearly every customer support interaction I have leaves me unsatisfied because I don't go to customer support without Googling something right, without checking on it, right? So I'm looking for a sophisticated answer. I'm looking for the next level answer. Um, this is a place where essentially even the play, people who have trained there are trained on a certain corpus of information and, you know, they're told, hey, answer within all these Q and A's from the past. That is an ideal use case for generative AI. And there are solutions that are, company, that are available today already from, you know, Yenas and others that do that. Right, so that's a place where you can dramatically improve your customer support, especially on the consumer side of the house. Um, uh, but you know, any use case where you are, for example, summarizing uh, a bunch of information. So let's say you're a financial services institution and you do analyst reports, and those analyst reports are generated by going over tons and tons of data on various companies. You can actually ask a generative AI system to go through the same information and create the first draft of that uh, analyst report. So it's, it's still designed for an expert analyst to go, you know, actually massage it into the right thing, but it does that first draft, which is gonna look pretty, pretty awesome, right? So I think in, in situations, wherever you're kind of trying to get reports written, uh, which is summarization. You're trying to, you know, uh, get the first draft of a contract written or similar things. The places where you're trying to query a corpus of information, and it could be an internal search system, for example, right? Just I want to search for internal documents. Generative AI will give you that information in a much better way, right? So, I mean, we, we can keep going on use cases, but that should give you a hint of the uh, type of use cases. Marketing copy is another one, right? Uh, where you can- you Thanks, Sumit. Yeah. Uh, you know, since we started answering uh, Q&A uh, from the audience, let's keep going on that. We'll go to our lightning round afterwards. So, um, from one, one very specific question, uh, from, a board in, in, from a board's perspective, the investment that's made in, uh, in, um, in AI systems and tools is this considered as a capital expense or do is this seen as a cost of doing business? Or both. Both. Yeah. It's both. It is. I, it, look, it, what's interesting right now from a technology and an investment standpoint is the cost just continues to plummet. And the ability to bring Lego pieces, I describe our technology stack that we built at the NFL as Lego pieces. Lego blocks, which allows us to reduce the cost and have the, the open source, not open source in terms of usage, but open source from another standpoint. Um, and you have to treat it as both. Um, as yeah. any company in any industry that isn't looking at this as both an investment and a necessary just hygiene of running the business, I think is missing the fact that this is disruptive and disruption is both positive and negative. It's pretty hard to think of any industry right now that somehow has some magical walled garden that's going to prevent it from being impacted. I mean, even industries that are excessively bureaucratic and regulated, insert healthcare, 
we talked about this 20 years ago with and during IBM's 15 years ago, IBM's early phases with Watson and the commercialization. The thought was healthcare would be the primary area that would benefit from it. The dilemma you ran into was data availability and privacy and all the things that, but healthcare is on the, at the tip of the spear, not necessarily generative AI, but certainly the technology revolution that's going on, although there's a role for generative there as well. So it's both, it's critical. Agreed. Yeah, do you want to comment on that? No, I was just going to say, you know, you might think you're, you know, you're, you're not really a tech company, but as Sumit was mentioning, you know, it can be used in your marketing function, your, you know, HR or legal function. So, you know, it's, it may not be your, you know, part of your core product, right, or core solution, whatever it is that you sell, but, you know, there are functions that are going to be impacted by this technology. So, you know, it has to be both. If I may jump in, Fahad, um, I'll be more uh, aggressive, okay? <laughs> uh, the internet has just been invented and you're thinking, hey, should I create a website? And your competitors are thinking, man, another channel to sell stuff, right? That's the difference, right? Yeah, sure, you can create a website and it's informational and oh my God, I got to go hire people and it'll cost me money to go to, and, and your competitors are thinking, boy, I just found an amazing channel to connect with this, you know, uh, let's say rich community of customers and so on. And, and that's, that's what AI and generative AI is. It is an absolute opportunity to do something, to produce new products, to do something amazing for your customers. Uh, you just have to figure out what it is. Right. I, I mean, we, we can go industry by industry and, and talk about opportunities, but every industry has an opportunity to dramatically grow their revenue. Every company has an opportunity to dramatically grow their revenue using AI and ML. Um, Sumit, you mentioned earlier, uh, English becomes the top coding language. Um, how, so if that's the case, would a skill set like uh, how to prompt AI with excellence in order to get the best results become the, the, you know, one of the, the most sought, sought after skill set? Um, and if so, how should, how should um, boards and, and management teams start to think about cultivating that? For the near term, yes. But this is like, you know, um, when search engines first came out, you had, you know, Alta Vista and I forget all the ones, but you know, my, my big unique value proposition in grad school was I knew how to find things on the internet. And then Google destroyed me. It came up and you could say, write anything and it would give you a good result. And I'm like, damn, nobody cares about me anymore. So I think in the short term, prompt engineering is going to be complex because you're basically, to some extent, the tech companies are exposing a little bit of a raw tech to you. Right, which which means that you know the way you ask it questions, it, it tells you different answers, but they're going to improve, right? They're so improve. Keep, keep in mind, it's been six months, right? It's been six months, so give us time. We we will get there, but at the, at the same time, right now, that is an important skill. Paul, what's your take on companies adding board members with expertise in AI, and and when does it make sense to do so? It's a great question. While every circumstance is a little unique, certainly adding board members that have capabilities in whether it's AI or in data and analytics or the advanced technology and the deployment and the application of advanced technology, I would argue makes sense for most boards, if not all, uh, and looking for individuals that have that degree of skills jumps out at me as a gap if a board doesn't have it. So I don't know if I'd say I want to grab somebody who's an quote AI practitioner. I think from a board standpoint, when you get up in the morning, you think about everything that's playing out. AI is part of a broader set of capabilities that are affecting industries and affecting what we do and how we do it. Uh, and again, Hyatt was forward leaning in doing it. You see other boards starting to do it. Um, what I would ask of, of any board going down this path is, do you have the skill set on the board to be able to provide the right governance and advice and counsel to the business and the industry the business is in? And if you don't, finding those skill sets on the board, I would argue, is a big part of the role of the board, at least the non uh, part of the board or the non governance part of the board that goes through that journey. 
Um, so that would be my take uh, on it. Obviously, finding an individual that's had business application along with that matters. It's a combination of the technical experience as well as the application, and preferably somebody who's been in an industry that's gone through the transformative side of this helps yeah. as well. Uh, those are all the pieces in my mind that make a difference, and I would encourage any board to certainly be evaluating this and discussing it. Ms. Power, that would answer it directly and say, you know, now is the time. I don't think there <laughs> has been a better time to get somebody with that expertise. Given, Not a little self-serving. <laughs> yeah, given the opportunities. And, you know, even if you look back like 15 years ago, you know, even 10 years ago, there were not as many people, you know, who had used data analytics, AI, and, you know, in, in a meaningful way to transform. But now there are many more of us. Right. So, it, you know, there is no excuse for boards to not get somebody with that AI expertise or at least, you know, start getting engaged in the discussions. The timing is now. Um, Mina, one of the questions very specific that we have is uh, you mentioned uh, board members should get educated and self-educate themselves um, yeah. you know, on this on this technology. Any recommendations that you have on, on where they should go? I mean, there's a plethora oh. of courses. Oh yeah, that's the easy one, right? Just ask Bard and you know, uh, since Sumit is here, I'm going to say just ask Bard and you know, it's going to, that. that is one where even if the results are not accurate, you're going to get something that you can use. Uh, honestly, that, you know, and let me actually make a comment about hallucination since we've talked about it a lot. You know, the way I view hallucination is, you know, you have to look at it from the lens of reliability. If your software is not giving you accurate, reliable information, then, you know, we like to humanize it and call it hallucination, but really it's a reliability issue. So address it the way you would have addressed a traditional software's reliability issues. You know, if it's not reliable and that doesn't work for your use case, do not use it, right? Because you know it is going to give you unreliable information. And the other points we need that made to solve for that reliability issue is to box it. Generative AI works, when it's put in certain boundaries, right? So, you know, I think that is one use case where you can actually ask uh, Bard and get that information and use it. Um, Paul, how, it, it, another qu question we have in our Q and A stream, how does the board ensure that vendors and partners that we work with um, are managing their risks accordingly? So there's a variety of things that occur. If you're looking at it from a more of a data security standpoint, you ensure SOC to compliance of any vendor. That's or something along those lines. Uh, you have to make sure that your acquisition organizations have the discipline in the vendors, especially if the vendors are sharing data, using data, part of the decisioning flows, all of those things that go along with it. So there are tools and capabilities that are in place. And therefore, that stewardship becomes critically important in, in any of those relationships. I would also say we've been doing a lot of work around uh, acquisition of companies. There's also, it's very important also as you're acquiring companies that you understand, especially if their workflows or their technology driven by these applications that you understand the stewardship and the structure that goes along with it. And I would really make sure that you're asking those questions, especially if you're a member of the audit committee, which I am now and have been in the past, that you're understanding that disciplined approach and ensuring that the operations from a managerial standpoint are taking those factors into account. So for instance, at the NFL, you have to be SOC 2 compliant. It's not open for discussion. Um, I think we've covered most of the questions that we have in the stream. Um, why don't we move, switch over to our lightning round then? We'll start with, uh, with, 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 well, well, with Paul, then we'll go to Bina and then Sumit. Um, what are your top questions that you think boards should be asking their management teams today? And given time, let's, let's say we, we do top three questions. Number one would be, how are you thinking about this next phase of the digital journey we're all on? which includes generative AI, but equally as important. How are you thinking about it? That's a good question. And how are you perceiving of it in terms of risk and most importantly, opportunities? That would be question number one. Question number two, from my standpoint, always with the board is the enabling oversight functions, whether it's data security or data governance or those sorts of activities and making sure the processes are in place going forward. And then 
my third issue is always on the talent side and making sure that the talent development strategies are both being leveraged from an HR standpoint, because there's a lot of opportunity here that you see companies leaning into to leverage where this is all, where the technology is heading, but also making sure that the talent acquisition and development is making sure, is ensuring that you're bringing team members in who can fully help drive the transformation. By the way, I think the number one skill set going forward is problem formulation. Those critical thinking skills become absolutely important at each phase of this journey. Thank you, Paul. Nina? I think the number one question is, uh, you know, in addition to everything what Paul said, what I would add is also thinking about um, from, you know, is the risk that this technology opens is at every level, right? It's not just your IT team or your tech team, making sure that every uh, employee is empowered with knowledge about how to use this technology, whether it's including it in your employee handbook or training and you know, for setting, up, setting them up in a way that they can succeed. It's that marketing intern in your marketing department who is evaluating an AI tool that could be making a decision and not asking the right questions of the vendor. So I think a basic AI literacy, not only for the boards and the C-suite, but also every employee has to be included. Thank you, Bina. Sumit. Yeah, you know, um, I'm, I was listening to Paul and Bina and trying to think about what unique uh, perspective I can provide. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just thinking if I was CEO of a company, what I would be doing, right? And what I would be doing is figuring out every part of my business, how could I use generative AI, right? So first of all, I just ask any vendor out there to come pitch their product, right? Whether you're a startup, big company, small company, you know, come pitch the product, you know, I might buy it. it you know, you come and tell me, hey, I can make you make uh, writing marketing copy much easier for you. All right, let's do a demo. Let's do a POC, right? And and I think um, that's maybe the number one thing. In, in, in a sense, you know, a lot of people are asking, hey, how do I educate myself, right? That's a great way to educate yourself is for your industry, go find out who's servicing the industry with a new solution using generative AI and ask them to pitch the product to you. You don't have to learn what generative AI is. Just let them teach you, right? And, and that's a great way for you to find out very specifically what use case is, how can it be used in your market? And, and you know, um, uh, you know, I would say, by the way, uh, you know, a number of people ask how to educate yourself. I'll tell you, I just Google stuff and I read it. And if it makes sense to me, I keep reading more. And if it doesn't make sense, I move to the next one. Uh, like I just, while people are asking, I Googled it. And there is a McKinsey report on generative AI, which seems high level enough that, you know, anyone can use. There's a Google website. There is a website on Microsoft Azure's page, uh, which have sort of high level uh, descriptions. Um, uh, you know, these are good enough to sort of get you started. Uh, but I'm sure every vendor would be more than happy to educate you about your company and how it can use it. So that's that's one thing I do is really find out the use cases that are relevant and probably have a few people in your in the company whose job it is to find out what your competitors are doing or if there's a startup trying to disrupt your industry, right? Uh, and, and that's another great way to educate yourself is look at what the competition is doing. Thank you, Sumit. Um, one more question, Sumit, and uh, we, we hear a lot about um, people raising the question around decelerating AI. Um, what's your take on that? So, say again, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, the, the, the notion that AI is moving too fast, somehow we need to slow it down um, so that we can think through all the implications and consequences. What's your take? This is like saying, slow down the internet, slow it down. It's going too fast. You know, <laughs> um, I, I think you really, I, you know, you, I think if my theme today has been anything, it's been, uh, how do I get on this train? Right. Because I know this train's only going to get faster. Right. And, and, and I just need to get on it quickly and, you know, get with it, not fight it. You're not going to fight it. Otherwise you're going to get run over by the train. Thanks, Sumit. 
Paul, Bina, anything to add? I, Jeez, I just wanted to say, ahead, Bina, sorry. Please. I was going to tell that you gathered three panelists who are all AI optimists, but also very balancing the risk with opportunities. That's the, you know that's the way to go. So get on that train, but be aware that you might need a hand. Then make sure that you know the train is the right one. And um, you know I think that there is a lot of progress to be made. Just be aware of you know the full context. Thank you, Vina. Paul, the genie's out of the bottle. So we can we can have this conversation. And for anybody that hasn't read the book, How the Internet Happened, I would encourage you to read the book, How the Internet Happened, and how we assumed one thing and the platform ended up resulting in something else. Because once the capabilities are unleashed, they go in directions you never, never think of. In fact, in my world of data and analytics, I look back on building those core capabilities at big companies. Once the platforms are built, platforms, air quotes, it's going to go. So you better make sure you govern it and have the right stewardship, but the genie is out of the bottle. So good luck trying to slow it down. Thank you, Paul. Um, and with that, uh, just doing a time check on behalf of Russell Reynolds Associates and my co-sponsors, I would like to first thank our panelists, uh, Bina, Paul, and Sumit for sharing these insights and helping us get better prepared on this topic. Um, and also thank our audience that listened and participated um, as we heard, generative AI is evolving fast and the conversation around it must keep up. Um, we will continue to stay plugged in and conduct future events to support this community. So stay tuned um, and feel free to reach out if you have further questions. Have a great weekend. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.